Now let's move on to discuss another antiviral drug, Gansiclovir. But first, let's spend a moment to look at this high yield image that you most likely will see on your step one exam. Looking at it closely, what are some important things you notice about this image? The key thing that's seen in this image is the presence of al I inclusion bodies seen here. Now let's thinking back to our virology section, what does the presence of al I inclusion bodies indicate? Al I inclusion bodies are significant for an infection by the CMV virus. Very good. So again, ciclovir is a guanosine analog that is used to treat CMV specifically. It is very important to fight infections in the immunocompromised patient, specifically three diseases. Do you remember what three diseases CMV can cause in an immunocompromised patient? The three important diseases are a CMV colitis, a CMV retinitis, and a CMV esophagitis. Very good. To understand the mechanism of action of ganciclovir, all you need to do is go back and watch the previous slide because it has the same mechanism of action as aciclovir or valaciclovir. It is a guanosine analog that inhibits the viral DNA polymerase. It's important to note that ganciclovir is specific only to CMV virus because it is activated by a kinase specific to CMV. Remember, aciclovir and valaciclovir are active against herpes simplex virus because the kinase that activates those drugs are found in HSV only. Ganciclovir, on the other hand, is not active against HSV because the kinase that activates it is found in CMV only. Important thing to know about ganciclovir is that it is more toxic than aciclovir and can cause a number of hematologic complications such as leukopenia, neutropenia, and thrombocytopenia. Clearly, with these hematologic complications, we know that this drug is less specific for virally infected cells and is more toxic to our bone marrow cells. Therefore, it is causing these hematologic complications. The drug Foscarnet is another drug that is used to treat CMV when ganciclovir fails, as well as HSV when aciclovir fails. This drug is highly toxic and is only used when aciclovir or ganciclovir therapy fails. Here's an image of pyrophosphate and phosgernet. You notice that they're similar looking molecules. So this drug works by inhibiting viral DNA and RNA polymerases by occupying the pyrophosphate binding site of the polymerase. So with this in mind, if we think back to our enzymatic biochemistry, what kind of inhibition is phosgrinet working by? Phosgrinet is working by competitive inhibition because it resembles the substrate structure and competes for the enzyme binding site, in this case, in the polymerases. Unlike ganciclovir and aciclovir, phosgrinet does not require activation by a viral specific kinase. This is useful in cases of aciclovir or ganciclovir resistance because remember, the kinases that mutate do not activate the aciclovir or ganciclovir. So even in situations where the virus has developed mutations in those kinases, phosgrinet will still function and kill the virus. But ultimately, these viruses can still become resistant to phosgrinet by mutating their own DNA polymerases instead of the kinases. Now, like I said earlier, the reason this drug is only used in severe cases of resistant viruses is because it causes severe nephrotoxicity. It also can lead to electrolyte abnormalities, and in fact these abnormalities can become so severe that the patient may develop seizures. Now thinking back to seizures, do you remember what beta-lactam antibiotic has a high risk for seizures in patients? That would be the carbapenem drugs. Very good. Sodafavir is very similar to Foscarnet, except in the fact that it preferentially inhibits DNA polymerases and not RNA polymerases. Remember, Foscarnet preferentially inhibits both DNA and RNA polymerases, while Sodafavir only inhibits DNA polymerases. This drug 
like phosgranate, does not require phosphorylation by viral kinases and is useful in treating CMV retinitis and herpes simplex virus that is resistant to acyclovir. It is actually more potent than phosgranate, but unfortunately, it has greater toxicity than phosgranate and can lead to irreversible nephrotoxicity. This drug is not commonly used except in severe situations. Now it's time for a flash quiz. Acyclovir targets which viruses, and what about gancyclovir? Acyclovir targets herpes simplex virus and varicella zoster virus, while gancyclovir targets CMV. It's important to remember that acyclovir and gancyclovir are both guanosine analogs that work by a very similar mechanism of action. The only difference between the two drugs is that they're activated by different kinases that are seen in the different viruses. Okay, now we're going to discuss the biggest section in antiviral therapy, the drugs used to treat human immunodeficiency virus. These drugs are called the antiretroviral medications. The treatment advances in antiretroviral therapy over the past few decades have been astounding. HIV used to very much complicate patients' lives, and many patients died from HIV infection and its complications. But now, with new and sophisticated medications, HIV is a virus that can be managed throughout a lifetime. Instead of dying from HIV, patients are now dying with HIV. The five classes of drugs used to treat HIV infection are the protease inhibitors, the nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, the non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, the integrase inhibitors, and the fusion inhibitors. Now, if we remember from our virology section, the human immunodeficiency virus is an RNA virus that has an insatiable ability to mutate its genome. With this ability, the virus is able to evolve quickly and become resistant to most drugs we treat it with. So say we have an HIV virus, we treat it with drug A, it mutates, we treat it with the new drug B, mutates, we treat it with the new drug C, and on and on. However, what if we gave drug A, B, and C all at the same time? Well, by giving multiple medications with different mechanisms of action, or what we call drug cocktails, we enable ourselves to attack the virus from different angles to prevent it from mutating by killing it first, okay? So by giving medications, multiple medications with different mechanisms of action, we can kill or stop the virus from replicating before it has the ability to mutate. This concept is the theoretical basis for what is known as the HAART therapy, or highly active antiretroviral therapy. Heart therapy consists of two nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors plus either a one non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor or a protease inhibitor. In an ideal world, heart therapy is initiated at diagnosis of HIV infection. However, oftentimes patients that are infected with HIV don't know they have HIV, and the therapy is not started until the patient shows up to the hospital with PCP pneumonia or some other opportunistic infection. So with this overview, let's begin going over the individual therapies, their mechanisms of action, and their toxicities. First, we're going to discuss the protease inhibitors. These include atazanavir, darunavir, vasempranavir, etc., etc. All of these drugs end in navir or avir. Now, a mnemonic that First Aid has created to help us remember these drugs is never tease a protease. You can remember with never kind of sounds like never, and we can try to remember that we never want to tease a protease, and this can help us remember that these medications. Now, thinking back to virology, do you remember the function of the HIV protease? Well, here's a simple flow diagram of HIV replication. First, the viral RNA converts itself to its DNA through that reverse transcriptase enzyme that is unique to these viruses. It then follows the central dogma of biochemistry where DNA is transcribed into RNA, RNA is translated into protein, and protein is then turned into the functional units. The protease is responsible for this last step. It converts the protein and converts it in its functional unit. 
Very good. These drugs inhibit this step and prevent the HIV virus from producing its functional units and rendering it ineffective to replicate and make new viruses. An important one of these HIV protease inhibitors is ritonavir. Ritonavir is interesting because it inhibits cytochrome P450 and as a result it boosts up concentration of our other HIV medications. So therefore we can give ritonavir alongside other HIV medications to boost the concentration of the drugs and make them more effective. The side effects of these drugs include hyperglycemia, lipodystrophy, nausea and diarrhea, and specifically with indinavir, it can cause hematuria. So you can almost think of the protease inhibitors as increasers. They increase glucose in the blood, causing hyperglycemia. They increase fat redistribution into weird places, causing lipodystrophy. They increase GI motility, causing nausea and diarrhea. And then they also increase blood in the urine. So if all else fails, we can think of proteases or the protease inhibitors as increasers, increasing the side effects and increasing our ability to fight HIV. The next drugs are the nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. The drugs are listed here. I know there are a lot of them and they're not nicely named as the protease inhibitors, but let's do our best to try to look at them and recognize the names. On the exam, they're not going to have you, you know, say spell the name or spell these drugs correctly, but they're going to want you to recognize them in the stem of a question. So just by glancing at them real quickly, we can identify some similarities, such as three of them end in budine, one or two end in ovir and avir. We have one with an abine. You can just kind of recognize some similarities and unique features of the names to hopefully recognize them when you see them on the exam. As the name suggests, these drugs are nucleoside analogs that inhibit the reverse transcriptase enzyme of HIV. So we remember back to our flow diagram here. Viral RNA or HIV RNA is converted to DNA with a reverse transcriptase. The viral DNA is transcribed to mRNA, which is translated to its protein, which is then converted into its functional units by the protease. These enzymes, or these nucleoside analogs, competitively inhibit the reverse transcriptase enzyme and blocking this step here. Important thing to know about these drugs is that they must be phosphorylated to be active. The toxicities of these medications include bone marrow suppression, peripheral neuropathy, lactic acidosis, and pancreatitis with didanosine. The bone marrow suppression makes sense as an adverse effect because, remember, these are nucleoside analogs and they are inhibitors, and they have the ability to competitively inhibit our own DNA and RNA polymerases found in the bone marrow. So we can reverse this process by giving granulocyte colony stimulating factor as well as erythropoietin to counteract the bone marrow suppression caused by these medications. The peripheral neuropathy, lactic acidosis, and pancreatitis are just some random side effects associated with these medications, and in my opinion, fairly low yield for step one. The next drugs we're going to go over are the non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, which include the laverdine, efavirenz, and nefiropine. These drugs, as the name suggests, work by inhibiting the reverse transcriptase enzyme found in the HIV virus. However, it's important to know that they are not nucleoside analogs. They have a different chemical structure and work by a completely different mechanism. They bind to a different site on the reverse transcriptase enzyme than the nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, which were nucleoside analogs. So it's important to know since these aren't nucleoside analogs, they do not require phosphorylation to be active. Roltegravir is the next drug used in HIV therapy and it is the integrase inhibitor. This drug is not considered to be part of the HART regimen, which includes the nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, the non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, and the protease inhibitors. Roltegravir initially was approved only for use in individuals who had an HIV virus strain that was resistant to the HAART drugs, but now it can be approved and used in all patients. Thinking back to virology, do you remember what the function of the integrase enzyme is? The integrase enzyme is responsible for integrating HIV's reversely transcribed DNA into the host genome. 
So if we remember, HIV is an RNA virus that reversely transcribes its RNA into DNA, and that DNA is integrated into the genome of the host cell by the enzyme integrase. So by inhibiting this step, raltegravir prevents the virus from becoming part of the host cell and making new viruses. And fuvertide and maraviroc are fusion inhibitors that inhibit the fusion of the HIV virus into host cells. If you remember back to virology, GP120 and GP41 are HIV's most important surface glycoproteins. The function of GP120 is to dock the HIV virus onto the host cell. It is responsible for the attachment of the HIV virus to the CD4 T cell. GP41, or the transmembrane glycoprotein, is responsible for fusion and entry of the HIV virus. The way I remember this is that infuvertide starts with an E, which is earlier in the alphabet, and therefore it binds to the lesser of the two numbers, GP41, and maraviroc starts with an M and binds to the greater number, or 120. So remember, infuvertide binds to GP41, E is an earlier in the alphabet, binds to the smaller number. Maraviroc is the inhibitor that binds to GP120. M is later in the alphabet and therefore binds to the larger number, GP120. What constitutes the HART regimen against HIV? The heart regimen consists of two nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors and one non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor or a protease inhibitor. Very good.